You say it came back? Okay. So this morning, we are just weeks away from ending one of the, what we might say, longest years that we've ever had in Martinsville. Not the most difficult. I've been here since 1991, 1999, and we split twice in 1999. We split from the Collinsville congregation, came here with two-thirds of the membership, and then split again in the fall, and a third of them went back to Collinsville. But we baptized 37 people that year, so it all evened out on the plus side for us. Now, can you imagine having two splits in one year? And so, in 2004, we came back from overseas again, and in three years, we basically quadrupled in congregations. The Danville congregation was started, the Eden congregation was started, and the Pelham congregation is started, was started. And we need to remember uh, Levitus. Levitus' problem is associated with premillennialism. And so it's not like he's not teaching the truth on other areas. And if you have an occasion to encourage him, that would be good because he still watches our programs and he still loves us. But that's a point of difficulty. And so this past week, just as a way of encouragement, I learned that the individuals that Joey trained in Arkansas, one of them actually has taken over a Methodist church and is now preaching there. And I think they're going to have a split likely in that Methodist church because the district supervisor came in last week and tried to fire Vince and the folk there that are in that Methodist church are not happy with their supervisor. They want to be taught the truth. Now, I hasten to say that Vince is still attending with the local congregation where Leon attends, by the way. Uh, Leon Perkins is in Arkansas, and he, he drives three hours one way to attend with that congregation. And so very encouraging for him. And the, they meet an hour before the Methodist folk do, so it gives Vince a chance to get over there and preach to them. So this morning, when I say all that, I say we are ending a tremendous year in which we are really in my Facebook social pages, the people that I talk with and deal with and look at and our YouTube uh, group, we are the star of 2020. Never stopped having church, never stopped our meetings, baptized people from several different places during our tent meeting, made a presence in Danville, and it has been a tremendous year. We're now on television 50 hours a month, and that's a difficult load. And so Caleb and I certainly solicit your prayers in order to keep ourselves going. And you might say, why would you put yourself through that, this passage? Daniel 4.17, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will, now get this, and setteth up over it the basest of men. Now, it's hard for us with our finite minds to recognize what God does and how he does it. For instance, one of the basest men that I actually have kept up with is Donald Trump. And he's been in charge for the last four years. Now, you might not like me saying that about Donald Trump, but I generally don't care what anybody likes. Truth is truth. My investigation before he was elected demonstrated that he was the same kind of womanizer that Clinton was. 
And so I said that on television. A bunch of people got mad at me in the Church of Christ. But again, I don't care. Truth is what people are looking for. But at the same time, isn't it something that things do happen the way they happen? And I know this morning that because we are human, that we need some commentary here. When you read a verse like this, and this is what our job is, you know that we are pouring out some information on television. People everywhere are eating up our Exodus class. Can you imagine five, six hundred people sitting for two hours to watch an Exodus class? A, a music minister who has been watching us for 15 years told Caleb last week, he said, you are holding people, the pastors in Danville, accountable. The stuff that they do, the fact that y'all continue to put this information out there is making them have to pay attention with, about the stuff that they try to perpetrate on us. And this morning, when we're trying to figure out how it is that these things can be, we need to grasp them because if we don't grasp this, then we might fall by the wayside. We might, may think that God is not actually acting with us. And if, if you're reading in Romans chapter 11, let me just not uh, do our work. In Romans chapter 11, notice this. Romans chapter 11, verse 30. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? You ever wonder what God's doing? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? Back, back up. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Do you think you know what God is doing right now? Do you think that God is not having his way? I would consider that that could be the case. Because often we look at physical things and we do not take into account. And you might say, well, Johnny, how can we? That's a great question. Is there an answer? Absolutely, there is an answer. Now, this morning, I know that we sometimes have to be prompted. And that's exactly what's happened in Moses. In Exodus chapter 6, Moses has just met the leaders of the children of Israel coming back from Pharaoh and they are telling them, y'all need to get busy. Y'all are fooling around and I'm not giving you any straw because you seem to be so lazy. And Moses then answers God and says, you didn't do anything. You told me that if I came and prophesied in front of Pharaoh, something would happen and now the people are mad and they're basically saying we stink in front of the Egyptians, and this is God's answer. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of this land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham and Isaac and Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Now, y'all, do you know that the first time that God said that it was said like to someone that God's wrath was fixing to be poured out on them just happened in Exodus 4 to this man? He failed to circumcise his children. Here you are a leader, and you're telling these folk that God's about to do something and he had not circumcised his sons. That's the most basic element. Did we talk about this last week? That is the most basic element of the covenant with Abraham. You will circumcise your boys, your boy children on the eighth day and Moses didn't do it. And can you imagine how that would play out as Moses becomes their leader and he has not even kept the covenant himself? And the reason we bring that up is because that God is saying, I am about to let you see me in a way that you have never seen me. Now, you know, brethren, it is impossible to think 
of something that you have never imagined or that is not empirical. We only think psychology has been all up and down this. Philosophers have been all up and down this. You do not come up, the mind does not come up with some new idea that has not already been introduced by revelation. It just doesn't happen. Someone says, well, there's things in outer space. People did not start thinking about the things in outer space. Before we got to outer space, you see this, the moon? That's empirical. You can actually see it visually. That's one of your senses. Well, we can read about outer space. Yes, we can. We can read three different heavens. And so we could imagine that there is something out there. And it's very likely that individuals determined to go past our atmosphere because of that passage. It is definite the case that people who are heathens read the Bible. Any of y'all see the movie Noah, the last one? I don't blame you. I saw it for free. Charles wanted me to give my opinion about it, so I saw it for free. You see the word watchers? They had some gigantic rock men in that movie. Guess where they came from? That verse right there. Individuals in Hollywood, they are looking at the Bible to try to satisfy the minds of individuals that are religious that they want to come. They've got to have a plot. Let me see, y'all, God is working in this world. And this morning, it's my job to get you to be able to think in a way that you don't really understand. Now, here's our verse. Are y'all sure that you have not heard this? I'm doing so many lessons. If you did this, you would be saying yes because I watched your Tuesday morning show. But that's okay. If you didn't, I'm glad. You're hearing it now. This is basically this. Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus with, throughout all ages, world without end. Y'all, God is about to get himself some glory in this lesson that we're looking at. I'm saying when he's talking to Moses, he is about to actually let the entire world know who Jehovah is. And it will never end as far as the fear that individuals had as a result of Jehovah appearing and individuals getting to see it. And this morning, what I want us to do is I want us to realize that we have a very important job to accomplish in this congregation. Notice, if God is working and he puts people who he wants in charge, regardless of what we think about them, who's going to be next, I don't know. There's a bunch of people hating on Joe Biden and trying to figure out how bad he is. We just had one of the basest guys that I've ever seen be president. And now, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of vocation wherewith you are called. Literally, Paul has been a prisoner. He's not just using terms. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering. here we go, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. If you're not trying to keep the unity of the Spirit in this place, it's going to be shame, shame. What if God has been working all this year and it's about to open up what he's been doing? You think that's not possible? Notice, here's our problem. Now, don't let me go too quickly. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding, when you think about abundantly, that's a whole nother idea, is it not? Abundantly is a bunch. We're exceeding a bunch, exceeding abundantly, and then above all that you can pray about and all that you can imagine. And in this particular instance, he is actually saying to Moses, you don't know me yet. You don't know me by Jehovah, neither do they. And I am here to get rid of this bondage. Let's watch how this plays out. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me. Do you think that's our problem sometimes? Man, y'all. 
Can I ask you, have y'all have y'all been grinding your teeth this last year? And even with church things, has it been a nail-biting, grinding year? Want to beat your head against some wall or something? Some kind of relief? Moses starts out saying, they're not going to believe me. And that's why God's having to have this talk with him. Now, I want you to notice this. In Exodus chapter 9, I'm going to go ahead and use verse 16. Y'all, we're still on. God rules in the kingdoms of men. Okay, you ready? And in very deed, this is God speaking through Moses to Pharaoh after about three plagues. And he says, in very deed, for this cause I have raised thee up for to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Jehovah is about to let himself be known throughout all the earth. Now, I want you to ask yourself, do you know how long God has been raising this Pharaoh up? Do you know where it started? It didn't start at his birth. It didn't start in Exodus 1. God has actually been working a plan since Genesis chapter 41. And often it is the case because of the way individuals have been told that they're supposed to read, people do not know that the process began back there. Genesis 41, verse 34. Joseph has just been released from jail. And this is what he tells Pharaoh about the dreams that God calls Pharaoh to have. Let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plentieth years. Now, y'all, this is astounding. God is creating a bounty. You remember what we said a while ago in abundance? God is actually telling Pharaoh ahead of time that he is going to create a tremendous bounty and Joseph is there, and Joseph has just been let out of jail. Now think, think how it is. We don't think like this, do we? Man, I'm in jail. No, you are a deliverer who's waiting on your time. And look at what he ends up telling Pharaoh. Let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the land, hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food for the cities. Now, you're about to have seven years of unprecedented bounty. And here is Joseph saying, keep a fifth part of it. You know what he just started? He started a storehouse. And then when the plenty is over, what's going to happen? A famine. Well, what's going to happen during the famine? Now, I want you to just don't stop here. We're raising Pharaoh up. Well, it sounds like Pharaoh fixing to come down. Seven years of famine. Let's look at Genesis 47, verse 20. 47, verse 20. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. During the seven years of famine, the people had to come back to Pharaoh and buy food. And the worse it got, the more they put forward. And they ended up selling their land, their cattle, everything, and Pharaoh moved them into the cities. He bought up all of the land for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field because the famine prevailed over him so that the land became Pharaoh's. You seeing this? This is the power that God actually set up before that other Pharaoh was ever born. Pharaoh of Joseph has just become a supreme ruler throughout all of the earth. There is no one like him. God is building up Egypt, building up Pharaoh. He is a dictator. He is in control of everything. And what does he start doing? In Exodus chapter 1, what's he doing? He's got the children of Israel and all of his people too, building these huge monuments. Johnny, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah? I know somebody that just came from Egypt before we had our tent. 
What does that mean? Was in Egypt sailing down the aisle. Now, the aisle. She saw the monuments, the pyramids, and the great sphinx, the wonders of Egypt. When did they come on the scene? During these time frames right here, between that Pharaoh and the Pharaoh that we're looking at. And God says, for this cause I raised thee up. Now, were you thinking about God raising Pharaoh up all the way back, using Joseph? What if Joseph had faltered? What had he had given up before his time? And he ends up being in the process of getting us to the stage that we're looking at right here. Pharaoh is a world-renowned ruler. And God has put him there for what purpose? To demonstrate his power. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth and for this very deed, in very deed, for this cause have I raised thee up for to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Now, can you step back for a moment and now magnify, just, just like give God glory. Man. What a tremendous account when you put the pieces in it. Now look at our world. Wonder what God is about to do. I say, I'm readying myself for a great awakening, spiritual awakening. The charismatic movement, as we've said on several occasions, is gutting itself. They are in terrible shape. Kenneth Copeland, I played a video on Wednesday night. Kenneth Copeland basically saying, if you lose your job, your job is not your source of income. And then he went right on to say, well, they, they shut down the churches. What are we supposed to do? He said, you go down there and put your tithe under the door. What? You're telling me that I've lost my job, and the one thing I need to do is make sure I still give Kenneth money. That's all that is. And the, all of the denominations are doing it. And they're getting tired. There's a 70-something-year-old school teacher that's at Danville this, this morning. I had a study with him three weeks ago. Caleb has been talking with him. He came every other night to our tent meeting. Never been married. He's sick and tired of Baptist behavior. I think he's having a pride problem. Y'all pray for him. When you're that age and a school teacher, and you see it, it's kind of hard to admit that you're wrong, you know? I think that's his problem. And so basically, you see what we're saying? A spiritual awakening could be right around the, the corner, and you might be wondering, well, what is taking so long, and why are these people having such a hard time? Okay, we're going to start learning right now. Y'all, our biggest, one of our biggest problems is, is when we think about people that we talk to, we think one thing and a whole nother thing could be happening. We think they're not listening. We think they don't believe us. But do you know how hard it is to come out? Here is us getting to see psychology be played out. In Exodus chapter 8, the magician said unto Pharaoh, this is the finger of God, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Now you might have read that and said, Now wait a minute. Dude, your magicians are telling you this lice cannot be reproduced by us. Well, what have y'all been doing all the time? You see how Pharaoh's mind would be? It would not bother him that his magicians have started basically taking stock because they just admitted that they've been tricking him. These other things were the hand of God too, but through enchantments and different things and magic, they were able to do something, and we're supposed to know them, y'all. First Timothy chapter 4 calls them Janus and Jambres. You think God didn't want us to know who these magicians were? Those men were in the same kind of game that's going on out in the denominational world. They are convincing through trickery, sleight of hand, smoke and mirrors, Tell in future events. You know, I was talking to a young, a very educated young lady yesterday. 
And she basically said, as I presented some of this information to her, she's been in the Marines, three tours, and I was talking to her about Sharon Motley. And I had told her that we made fun of Sharon and Bill on TV, and she said, I just asked her, do you think there's only one true church? She studied with me before. She said, yes. And then when I said I, we were making fun of Sharon and Bill, she said, why would you make fun of a church? And I said, Jesus did it. And she said, where? I said, have you never read your famous judging passage? Jesus talks to the persons about judging unjustly in Matthew 7. And then he says, here's how y'all are. You've got a pole sticking out of your eye and you're working on a speck in somebody else. And she burst out laughing. She said, I never even thought of it like that. Yeah, Jesus using sarcasm with these folk, making a fool out of them. Matthew 21, same thing. Come to Jesus asking him the question, is John's baptism from men or from heaven? And Jesus said, same thing we do on what does the Bible say? Let us ask you a question and we'll answer yours. Let me ask you. No, they asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? And then he said, let me ask you, was his baptism from men or from heaven? And you know what they did. We got to see their psychology, didn't we? The Holy Spirit allowed us to know what they were thinking in print. They started thinking if we say it's a man, the people will stone us because they think John's a prophet. But if we say from heaven, Jesus is going to say, why didn't you be baptized? So they said, we don't know. Now, y'all, the people you talk to, are they any different than the Pharisees, the rulers? You try to get them to answer your question and you try to get headway and you try to figure out if they're listening to you. Are you getting anywhere? Is God's word getting anywhere? And you come away saying, I don't know. And they don't tell you. Why? Y'all, it's hard. They were thinking about their position if they were to tell the truth. It would be all over, and they would have to figure out in a new way. Y'all remember Neva Lee? Neva used to tell me all the time, Johnny, first member of the Church of Christ in Danville. She's a black lady. I'm a Texas cowboy hat wearing, no telling what all else I look like. And she lives with me on TV, and she has me come over and stood with her, and she obeyed the gospel. And she said, Johnny, the Church of Christ takes some getting used to. Don't you know that people are watching us and they are actually believing, but there's individuals that are tricking them. And we have to realize that and we have to process it now. Look at this. Exodus chapter 9 verse 20. This is what's going on while God is raising up himself to get glory. While he's working on Pharaoh. Can I ask you something? Is God about to bring America down and have some glory for himself? Because America just won't bow. I'm saying, literally, y'all, would you have not have thought this nation would be doing the same thing it did on 9-11? What'd they do on 9-11? All Congress was on the steps of whatever in D.C. And what were they singing? They were singing songs that had God in it. But now here we are, how many years removed, and the nation is crumbling, and what's happening? Nothing, as far as I can see, as far as humility and asking and praying and changing and acting different. But in Pharaoh's country, we were in 916, and we're about to have another plague, and Pharaoh has hardened his heart and won't hearken, but this plague is going to be hell. And Pharaoh's people, look at this, they're starting to believe. We have people that tell us all the time that their pastor's saying, stop watching. They're asking their pastors, why is Church of Christ open? Stop watching. People are starting to fear and they put their cattle in the house. Why? Because Moses said, hail is going to kill everything except for the children of Israel. Now the people are starting to pay attention. They're starting to fear. Did that change Pharaoh? No. Notice. The servants, you got the magicians, that's the preachers of today. The individuals who are doing the enchantments, who are doing the smoke and mirrors, sleight of hand, playing tricks. They got Pharaoh thinking one thing when he ought to be seeing another. 
You got the regular people, they're actually fearing God. And now look what you got. And Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man go? How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the man go, that they may let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? Can you see this? These individuals that are working on the people that we're trying to help have such a hold on them. Let me ask you this. Have y'all been keeping up with like the stuff that we've been doing with Jackie Poe? Y'all, River Church of God, River Oaks Church of God, they should be repenting in sackcloth and ashes. Do you know that Jackie Poe left in February? And the last year around, one of his, uh, uh, some of his congregants, children and our relatives were killed by a guy down in Keelan, Virginia. Y'all remember that, him running around naked and the police trying to mace him, carrying AKs or ARs? Jackie Poe has said that he could raise the dead. And there was an infant that was killed in that. And I watched Jackie beg for people to get down in the floor and do their thing. Nothing happening down in Danville. And so Jackie left right before Corona. And can you imagine how they're feeling? You don't have to imagine. You can basically see it right here. Individuals are starting to get the picture. And the persons closest to Pharaoh are saying, can you not see that we're being destroyed? Now, y'all, let's do psychology again. Don't give up on the word of God. If somebody can be as determined and delusional as Pharaoh, it doesn't mean that you're failing, does it? Does it mean we're failing because people are so delusional that they can't see the things that they've been told, particularly in the charismatic movement, the healing movement, this would be their hour, would it not? And nothing is happening, and don't you know that they're right here. They're wondering, why don't somebody get Kenneth Copeland off the air? And he is continuing, and their pastors are continuing to run them down. Now, y'all, you might say, well, Johnny, I don't know if we're really affecting these folks. Now, remember, I told you that the music minister said that to Caleb. The y'all are making the pastors be accountable. You think we're having influence? Do, or do you wonder how in the world, just how far this lunacy as we are saying about Pharaoh can go? You know what this is? That was a Pennsylvania County uh, free speech rally and they ejected me in front of everybody. And people actually clapped, some stood up and clapped and said, don't ever come back. Now, how can you be at a freedom of speech rally and end up acting that way? And the answer is they're under a spell, a huge spell, just like Pharaoh's servants are in this morning do you think that bothered me when they ejected me? I just got through having cancer, just had gotten back, and I was pretty pathetic, but still, it didn't bother me. That was an amazing moment for folk to sit there and watch. Baptist is what it was, particularly. Watch as a big sheriff deputy. I said, I have as much media time as anybody in this room. And he said, well, that fellow right there says you're leaving and you're leaving. Now, y'all. That's the kind of stuff that would make me want to defund the police. If you've ever been on the other side, which is not the good side of the police, you have seen some pretty radical stuff. And there are plenty of people who have seen some very terrible stuff by the police. I'm not for defund the police, by the way, but I have not liked the police in Pennsylvania County ever since I've been here. They've been rough. Now, here's the thing. We have to ask ourselves this morning, is it, the case, is it the case that the authorities are actually under the same influence that was influencing Pharaoh? 
if they would be willing to do that. And we have to ask ourselves this morning, do we know if God is going to do something in the favor of his people like he did in this particular instance? Are you at all encouraged this morning to realize that when Jehovah is at work, the infinite ability of God and our finite minds have to mix somewhere, have to meet somewhere, and here's where they meet. We get the wonderful opportunity, we get the wonderful blessing because we study hard to actually see what we could never have imagined. We imagine a man being so delusional that he digs a grave for his baby or his firstborn son. Everybody in Egypt digs a grave for their firstborn son and the firstborn of their cattle. They bury them in Numbers 33. See how far that is from Exodus? Numbers 33 is where you read that. And then after they get through burying everybody, that man, Pharaoh, says, what have we done? And he enters into his own grave. And what comes out? What comes out of that grave is the children of What is the grave? It's the Red Sea. It is his grave, but guess what it is to the children of Israel? In Hebrews 11, verse 29, when we say that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, we're talking about faith. That's the power. Pharaoh went in one way and the children went in another. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as, on, as by dry land, which when the Egyptians essayed to do, were drowned. Now this morning, when you think about God, like we've just started, just thought about him, is it anything for God to choose a foolish thing like you confessing that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he raised him from the dead and be willing to repent of being involved in these religions that have these delusional pastors up there, their, book, their church is not in this book and their practices are not in this book and they're actually against the practices of this book. And those individuals refuse to accept that you going into water upon your repenting of listening to those delusional individuals and actually taking God at his word, they refuse to believe that God is able to raise you up a new creature out of the watery grave. Is that not what we're reading? They went into their grave, a watery grave. They died. And the children of Israel came out of that same watery grave. And guess what? Forty years later, Rahab tells the spies, we are scared to death of y'all. And so were everybody else. And you might say, well, how do you know? I have read the song of Moses. Have you? It's in Exodus 15. That's what God was doing as he put Israel through those hardships associated with the plagues. They had to be there too. They weren't plagued, but they had to be there and they had to be mistreated. But when you read the song of Moses in Acts 15, the song says that he was putting the terror of his people into all of the people of the land of Canaan. Now, this morning, could we not have a good year? Next year, man, we have had a bountiful year this year. Baptist preacher obeying the gospel, all the different things that have happened. Y'all, do y'all know, I don't have to have support from churches anymore. How about that? I'm supported by individuals now, and they are crazy about what we do. Just bought us new equipment downstairs. We've got two new technicians, Antoine and Ian, producers, Letting Joey have a rest? Man. The question is, y'all, I'm looking at y'all. God's looking at y'all. Now, y'all, am I doing my part about getting the word out? 
And you might say, well, I'm tired of talking to my neighbors. So am I. I talk to them basically 50 hours a week. And I do. I'm not tired yet. Not really. I just said that. As long as we can keep it up, we're going to. We all need to start realizing circumstances change. And when they do, the magicians start saying, oh, man, that's Jehovah. And then when the hell comes, the people of Egypt say, oh, man, we better get our cattle in. They start fearing God now. And then the closest people to Pharaoh said, man, what's wrong with you? This city is destroyed. How do you know the circumstances haven't changed to the point that somebody that rejected the information you gave them before will receive it now? I know what the chances are. I just got through reading them. They're very good. So this morning, again, Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. This is us. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another. That means putting up with each other. Y'all, everybody's having trouble right now. I'm saying families, they tense, sometimes have arguments about things that they wouldn't argue about for anything. Last year, but this year, having to be in the house and seeing the same people over, over and over, some being sick, things of that nature. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The children of Israel had to hold it together to be able to see God's name, Jehovah, be glorified throughout the whole earth. This morning, we're having visitors in both locations. It's good to see Lisa here, someone we dearly love. We've been having individuals visit with us from Eugene's family, and it is a great opportunity for us to be able to tell the truth here this morning and we can assist you in getting closer to God obeying the gospel and being added to the church that is doing what the Bible says and is found in the Bible if you're here this morning this is the Lord's invitation while we stand my goal these days is ramped up by about 50%, and you might say, well, how in the world is that possible? Well, just to give you an example, since Monday, I've put 24 hours of new air time in place so that people at 2 a.m. can watch it. So if you're a person who can't sleep, that's going to be going at least through the 24th, and surely there is no reason I can't get the last seven days up as well, which moves us, I think there's a 31st in December. That's ramping it up. And even though I don't have to go to the television station at 2 a.m., it's still a very lengthy process in order to get that information done. It was the entire day from before daylight till after daylight on, on Friday to get that information in place where all they have to do is just move it over to their computer at Star News. And so we're very fortunate, I believe, y'all, and I really think that if you haven't thought about it, you certainly need to include Charles in your prayers. Some people might think that he's even been called several ugly names by members of the church here, but Charles has probably helped more people learn the truth than any other individual or entity aside from ourselves. And I've told him on more than one occasion that I pray for him and that I consider him to be like the Pharaoh that enabled Jacob, Joseph to deliver his family, even though that Pharaoh is not listed particularly as a faithful individual to God, nevertheless, he, like Nebuchadnezzar, was an instrument that God used to accomplish some very great feats. And ultimately, as a result of individuals, and that's going to be our theme this morning, as a result of individuals, a couple of them, and on occasion, three of them, a great number of individuals in the Babylonian kingdom turn to God as well as Nebuchadnezzar. And so, y'all, uh, Charles knows that I love him 
and he also knows that we all appreciate him, and so please be praying for him. Um, he has really become an ally in regard to trying to help us do better and to have more information put out. So I think um, I'm quite positive that we'll see results as a result of the nighttime television. This morning, the reason I said that is because we now find ourselves as one of the main conduits for brotherhood information. When I say that we're upping, ramping up by 50%, what I'm actually saying is, is we're trying harder, and as a result, it makes me realize that we could have missed some steps here with y'all, like we could have assumed certain things were happening as far as the teaching process, and maybe it wasn't the case. And so uh, Caleb and I both are looking into means by which we can do better and help us all do better. And so this morning, basically you're here during this lesson to be instructed. Now, instruction and edification are two separate entities. Being instructed means you're getting information, but being edified, built up, is a totally different entity. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that you are being instructed and that basically once you're properly instructed, you've achieved something. Now let me give you the opposite of that. This is a college level uh, book on preparing instructional objectives. One of the reasons why many preachers that you listen to, that you might have listened to through, throughout the years that have been associated with us, one of the reasons why you may not be as thrilled about them, because I've actually heard people say to me, Johnny, why do y'all bring those men up here? They don't preach as well as y'all do. One of the reasons why that's the case often is because preachers nor teachers whether it be in the school system, wherever it is, they often don't know how to set an objective. And you might say, well, I don't really know how to tell when someone doesn't know how to set an objective. Let me see if I can make this work. Here's a little story that's in the preface of this book. Once upon a time, a seahorse gathered up his seven pieces of eight and cantered out to find his fortune. Before he had traveled very far, he met an eel who said, Psst, hey, bud, where are you going? I'm going out to find my fortune, replied the seahorse proudly. You're in luck, said the eel. For four pieces of eight, you can have this speedy flipper and then you'll be able to get there a lot faster. Euphemism for God that I'm not going to use. That's swell, said the seahorse, and paid the money and put on the flipper and slithered off at twice the speed. Soon he came upon a sponge who said, Psst, hey bud, where are you going? I'm going out to find my fortune, replied the seahorse. You're in luck, said the sponge. For a small fee, I will let you have this jet-propelled scooter so that you'll be able to travel a lot faster. So the seahorse bought the scooter with his remaining money, and he went zooming through the sea at five, five times as fast. Soon he came upon a shark who said, Psst, hey, bud, where are you going? I'm going to find my fortune, replied the seahorse. You're in luck. If you'll take this shortcut, said the shark, pointing to his mouth, you'll save a lot, yourself a lot of time. Thanks, said the seahorse, and zoomed off into the interior of the shark and was never heard from again. The moral of this story, or this fable, is that if you're not sure where you're going, you're liable to end up someplace else. Now, it is certainly the case that a lot of instruction goes that way, would you say? A lot of times it's often the case that a person sometimes might say, I don't know where in the world this lesson was going. 
And so, this morning, we want to make sure that we are instructed because when we're instructed, we actually achieve something. Often, in Christianity, this is kind of how things look. Seven unwritten rules of work you need to know. Well, if they're unwritten rules, how are we going to know what they are? Anybody who has ever had a new job knows. That's a nervous time when you start, isn't it? Everybody buzzing around, they know what they're supposed to do. You're scared to do anything because you might do it wrong. And then you start trying and you make mistakes and it's so frustrating and you just wonder to yourself, when will I ever get used to this job? And some people even quit at that point. And it's that way often, I think it's that way, sadly, in the majority of churches. Individuals do not know what they're supposed to be doing. Now, instruction is one thing. Edification is another. If you're instructed well to the point that you actually recognize what it is that you're supposed to do, then you're edified. That's when you're edified. Now, it is the case that at that point also something starts happening. Your will actually starts entering in. So being edified for a moment and realizing, hey, that's what I need to be doing, or actually I now realize what it is that I need to do, that's a very edifying experience and encouraging experience. But then when you get out, or when you go away, what happens? Well, James 1 says we see ourselves in the mirror and we basically see as we are, but then we go straight away and forget what a manner of man we were, which basically means that as we were seeing things that we should or could do, like recognizing an area that we could work in, then reality sets in and we start having to fight with different things that are in the way. Now here's, the, here's a, a statement that we need to deal with too. Work. If I say, man, we need to go to work, that is such a useless phrase. What does work mean? It's kind of like saying somebody needs to do something. Even the phone book did not contain somebody and it has everybody in it. Somebody is a very ambiguous term. Generally, nothing gets done when you say somebody needs to. That's the same thing when you're talking about work. Work is such a generalized thing. What is it that we can actually do? Now, this morning, what I'm trying to do is to get a thing from me into your mind. I'm basically trying to get in your mind the overall view of Genesis to Judges this morning in the short time that we have together. Now, I hope that you would say, man, Genesis to Judges? Remember, I said the overall view. I can do it basically in three words. Individuality invading and occupying. Now, do two of those make sense? Invading and occupying? I think everybody knows that the book of Joshua is about invading, but did you know the book of Judges is simply about the occupation? Well, what does that have to do with us? If it doesn't have anything to do with us, we're wasting our time. Like this is just some information I decided to just throw out there this morning. If it doesn't apply, then there's no point in it. It's just rattling around and useless. We actually have done the same thing that they did in the Exodus. We've come out of bondage. That's when we left behind the old man, buried it, repented, and were baptized and raised to walk in newness of life. We have come out of bondage. And now it is our job to invade the devil's territory. And we'll look at that as we go forward. And then to occupy. And then individuality. Why do you think I brought up individuality? 
if you really get down to it, and this is like I am trying really hard, y'all, these days, because, um, and it's not just because anything has happened necessarily. The feedback I'm getting from my broadcast on Genesis and Exodus, people are calling me and writing me, sending money, because they are just so overwhelmed that they had never been taught the simplicity of the overview of this information. As you know, as we've discussed, most people start in Genesis, in Genesis 1, and it's just like, man, do I have to read Genesis 1 and 2 again? I'm saying it's not like every part of the Bible is actually applicable and necessary, useful for you. Is Are the qualifications of an elder something that the ladies in here need to all memorize so they can be ticking them off? Only if we're talking about installing elders. So it really wouldn't be the case that you're always needing to try to commit to memory 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. Likewise, Genesis 1 and 2. It is the case that some information isn't necessarily, it, it basically the point was that's not where you need to start if you're going to start reading the Bible. And so these individuals are telling me this, y'all, and it's killing me. It's basically making me realize that our poor brethren are just basically starving to death. They don't have the instruction properly in place, and if you don't have instruction in place, what can you not do? You know you can't teach another person. And that's one of the reasons that we're having such difficulty. Our brethren then do potlucks and all kinds of other things to keep themselves busy and to encourage themselves or to do whatever. It's not really encouraging. They think it is, but they never get involved in work. And so this morning, I actually am going to be putting some of this as just going to be reading because I'm trying to write this information down so that we can dispense some of it. Genesis is an account of three particular men. Do you ever think about looking at Genesis in that way and actually condensing down? If you don't, if you take Genesis and you say 50 chapters, man, 50 chapters is a lot of stuff, isn't it? Well, if you remember the other day, I told you about websites that do audio reading and actually have the text too on YouTube for when you're driving. If you're driving from here to Danville, you can just about go through um, at least half of Genesis because these chapters only last three and four minutes with this gentleman reading and he has a nice British accent. How about that? It is a very nice read, but when you think of it like that, it's kind of broad, isn't it? 50 chapters. But when you say, really? If you get down to it, Genesis is an account of three particular men, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The overall objective, what you are to process, that which God intends to impress upon you, full realization of the place the individual occupies in the very large scheme of things. Now, let me see if I can cement that. If it is the case that Genesis, all of that time, let's just go ahead and not be, um, let's just not, uh, not make sense. Let's not not make sense because somebody else might watch this. We all know that there's over a thousand years between Genesis, Adam and Eve and the flood. But we're basically saying, are those characters in there like extremely important? I mean, most of them perished in the flood or they perished in between and they really don't have a part to play. Their relatives don't have a part to play. Is that not right? Only Noah and his family has a part to play later. And so immediately upon Noah and his family emerging from the flood, you have the introduction of Abraham. And so basically, the rest of Genesis is occupied with three individuals. And in reality, if you want to get down to it, that is exactly what God is trying to get us to process. The individual. You know, y'all, in some countries, you cannot even practice individuality. Now, in America, have we kind of gone berserk 
on individuality. I mean, we have just individuality. I want to, I believe in New York there are 20 plus gender designations. That's individuality gone berserk, is it not? But the fact of the matter is, is that individuality is a very prominent thing in the Bible. Notice, the presence and behavior of these three men communicate a thought that must be understood in a bigger connection or their importance is lost. These three men are the primary players in getting God's plan done. That's an extremely uh, simplistic way of crunching down what you're supposed to get in the book of Genesis. Now it is the case, don't let me minimize, it is the case that they have many events that take place in their lives, but let's stay with this. Each of these men did one thing. This one thing is the primary cause of all the secondary events we will encounter in their separate lives. Now, you be thinking about that right now. What is that one thing that these three men did? And everything else, that one thing is the primary cause of all the secondary events that we'll encounter in their separate lives. Each man is considered simply as an individual. Every part of the storyline, each different narrative, is laid forth by God from the standpoint of allowing us to consider one individual and how his individuality, in other words, trusting God, accomplished something for God. Now, you might say, Johnny, why are you doing this? Do you ever wonder what it is that you are supposed to do primarily? What is the primary thing that these three individuals did? If you were to just like take it in a nutshell, what would you say? The answer is they remained faithful to one particular command. And that was the very essential part, the very individual thing that they were chosen for. They had one particular thing that they were supposed to do. They were supposed to be faithful in that they were supposed to stay in the land of Canaan and continue to worship God. Now, y'all, how hard is that? Individuals, we sometimes get caught up in the different projects and things of that nature, but one of the the primary thing as far as God is concerned in your life is that you be, that you have fidelity. Let's just put it this way. When you talk about your marriage, what is like the basic element of your relationship, husband and wife? Is it not simply when you bring it down to its most basic element, fidelity to each other? If you decide that you're not going to be faithful, I mean, do you have to have, I know we don't have to, to remind ourselves to be faithful to our husband or wife and them alone, and we all know what we're talking about. That's not what we're asking this morning. But do you have to ask yourself, am I being faithful to this man? In the sense that, am I paying attention to several different elements associated with his life and things that are going on with him? Or am I living my life, and he's living his life, vice versa, and we really don't even think about the element of fidelity to the actual whole of us staying together and accomplishing what we set out to do, have these children together, and what, do we, what did we plan to do with all that? That's what we're saying this morning. The one primary thing that they were to do is they were bringing a promise about. Basically, all of the secondary things that we read about Abraham, about Isaac, and Jacob, they are secondary to this one primary thing. Now, if we could say that about our life, you mean to tell me that all of the things that we read about Abraham, and I want to ask you when you read about Abraham, do you sit and 
say, I can't believe Abraham did that. Or you look at Jacob, and some people talk about him tricking his brother. And you say, I, I can't believe that Jacob did that. Do you, do you all remember that we had a lesson when we talked about the aggregate, like the entirety of a person's life? No human being can judge another person in the aggregate. It's impossible. Number one, you don't even know what goes on in people's lives behind the scenes. You have no idea what they're really doing. And basically, God is able to judge in the aggregate. And so when we talk about Abraham and him sending out one of his children, sending out one of his wives, or letting his wife be looked at as his sister, we look at that. Do you find yourself judging him? Y'all, really, God didn't let us see that in order for us to pass judgment on that. Is that not the case? When you're reading, is that what you're doing? What we really should be doing is realizing that each man is considered simply as an individual, and these three individuals get the job done. Like the entirety of God's plan is basically moved along 300 and something years because those three men did three things. Number one, they circumcised their children on the eighth day. And you might say, why is that so important? That is a sign that exists to this day, is it not? That was something that was so important that when Moses came back from his father-in-law ready to uh, assist in getting them out of the Egypt, God set out to kill him. Y'all remember that? We might not have recognized that, but that was a very significant thing that those three individuals did. What if nobody, let's just say there was one thing that had to be done, like the work of a lighthouse. That's all that guy has to do is keep the light burning. And all the secondary, what do you mean the secondary? Well, there's a lots of different things associated with keeping that light burning, but ultimately, how is his fidelity judged? All the ships coming in, they have no idea what that guy's doing, but they know if that lighthouse is shining, that man is doing his job. So number one, they circumcised their children. Number two, they remained in the land. Is that not simple? And number three, they believed in God's promise. Now, could we bring our life down, a faithfulness down to three things? If it's the case that that is the case there, and I'm encouraging you, I'm challenging you, you to read this in this way, like instead of letting all these different things in, enter into your head as you're going through, ask yourself, what, are, what is the basic with Abraham and just read it that way? Abraham is not able to see himself in the way God describes him. Abraham did not say of himself, I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. They shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice, righteousness, and keep my commandments. Now get this. Basically, God is describing right here what it means for Abraham to be faithful. I know him, this is Genesis 18, 19, I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they will keep the way of the Lord. The primary men allowing God's way, bringing up, up I was uh, audio texting, upon the, up on Abraham, maybe I wasn't, that which he had spoken of him in Genesis 18, 19. These three figures, Abraham himself, Isaac and Jacob. So basically, what were they doing? They were bringing up their families to trust God. I mean, when you, when you put it like this, is that so difficult? We don't have a lot of information about what it was that they, the requirements that they have. Y'all, I really don't think they had a lot of requirements. You might say, well, how do we decide? Well, there are ways to decide. For instance, Judah went in to his daughter-in-law. She pretended to be a harlot because Judah's sons, sons would not 
um, bring up seed to their dead brother. And so she decided that she was going to have seed, that she was not going to be childless, and that she was going to be a part of Judah's family existence, her inheritance, and she pretended to be a harlot, and she became pregnant. And once the little dealing was done, which if you know that account, Judah ended up finding out that he was the father. But before he found out it, he was the father, it was told him that she was pregnant, and he said to have her killed. What does that tell you? Logic tells you right there that there was some kind of law in place having to do with prostitution and our adultery and that he was going to call on that. And he ended up saying, you're more righteous than me when he found out that she was pregnant by him, that he had not kept his promises. But, but the point is, all we're doing is fishing for minor details. But what if the major element of your individual life one of the things that you basically tick off every single day and know that God would be pleased with you is this. I'm going to stay faithful. You know, you might think this in insignificant, but here's one of the things that happens with members of the Church of Christ. I'm saying this used to characterize all members of the church. If they quit, now you think with me, what did they not do? ever do if they quit attending with their brethren at the Church of Christ. Often they would leave out saying, well, I'm leaving, but I'll tell you this, I will never attend a sectarian or a denomination again. I may stay at home, or I may do this, I may come back, but I will never go back to denominationalism. Is that not significant? And so in a way, they are actually being faithful in the sense that they are never going to go back into that kind of era and support division. Y'all, Jason Hairston said that. As wild as Jason ended up turning out to be later, going off to Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever it was he went, I uh, can't think of his not wife, she actually said that Jason said he would never be in a denomination. Ronnie Martin, all this time being gone, never went to a denomination ever again. And so this morning as we're saying individuals and your individual responsibility and how important just being an individual is and what's required, if you said to yourself, if you were to tell yourself every morning, man, me being faithful, continuing to be faithful, continuing to be an active, just say it that way, Participant in Christianity is a major thing to God. Now, see what I'm asking you this, I'm going to ask you at this point. If that's true, if this instruction is true, are you not now built up? If you thought it was so broad that you never could accomplish like a particular plane or plateau, y'all, being faithful is a major element in the sense like your husband and your wife, I'm not leaving. You know, if we could say that about everybody, no matter what happens, they're not leaving. That's just one thing that's not going to happen. Even some of the individuals that did leave lately, one of the things they said is, we're not going to any of these churches of Christ around here. That's a good thing. They might not get credit for that or anybody ever say anything good about them for that, but it is a good thing. So, God tells us things about Abraham himself that Abraham himself could not say. But we do get to see it. And we start basically seeing that this individual just simply saying, I'm going to remain with God and I'm going to make sure my kids remain with God. And one of the ways they did that is male children were all circumcised. So, you think about that. If you were a child of Abraham, let me tell you what, you always knew that there was a covenant associated with your life because you had a mark that you could never forget. A failure in an event is not unfaithfulness. Do you ever think like that? Do you ever realize that that's the case? Y'all, a failure in your life is not unfaithfulness. An incident along the way continued to keep God's way. Genesis 18, 19 is what God said about Abraham. 
An incident along the way is not unfaithful. It is not unfaithfulness. God may say you were not faithful or you believe me not, but that's not the final summary. Now, can we do that for ourselves? I inserted the actual statement, you believe me not, because that's exactly what God said to Moses. He said, you believe me not. You struck the rock. But what's God's final summary about Moses? Y'all, Moses is said to be faithful in all his house in Hebrews 3, 5. So you mean to tell me that you can do something as major as lose your temple, you lose your temple, lose your temper, and end up striking the rock, which is comparable to Nadab and Abihu offering strange fire. The scripture says the same thing about both of them. You did not sanctify me to be obeyed in front of the children of Israel. But yet... That is an event, and the summary is you're faithful. Now, is that giving you too much liberty? Are we basically setting people up to just have these events that take place and we don't get all excited? I really don't think that us demonstrating that God is not making a final judgment every time you have an event. I don't think that's setting us up for us to become liberals. Do y'all? But isn't that a liberating thought process? Well, that's exactly what Galatians 5.1 says. We've been called unto liberty. Just don't let your liberty be an occasion for lasciviousness. Just because every event that happens isn't going to be a summary of your life, then make sure that you don't let that characterize. Now, I'm fixing, I'm about to, I'm about to move, and you may say, I don't know about this particular portion, but you're just going to have to bear with me. What I'm trying to do, Joey, is I'm trying to get this to allow me to be totally in Messenger. And I was in Messenger before. I plugged it up. View in open in messenger sorry Can you see that, Anna? Or is it still too small? Okay. So, in Genesis, we basically see the plan play out. Sometimes the plan seems to be only a blur because we basically have our minds blurred because of the perplexities encountered by these three main characters. But this fact is how God... God's plans are accomplished. Individuals go through countless perplexities, and these are the events through which faithfulness is seen or not. Y'all, you know, I don't know how you think about the things that you have to go through and the, the things where you misstep, but the misstep isn't really the problem, or we could say it like this, sin isn't really your problem. The question always ends up being, what are you going to do about sin? And if you said already, listen, I'm not leaving. I'm not quitting God. Well, then you've already stated that eventually I'm going to try or I'm in the process of trying to get a hold on this, on me, and deal with this sin. So 
you know, I don't know if this is making sense or not, but as we go through and watch the different things that happen to them, are we not seeing life for real? I mean, these are the kind of things that you get yourself involved in, and let's just say that getting out of it's a 20-year ordeal. That's, that was Jacob's life with his father-in-law. He made a decision to go there. He gets involved, and it's a 20-year ordeal to get back to the land of Canaan. Now, there's two key points to that or two thought processes. One, you might be saying, well, if he hadn't have left, he wouldn't have had all those problems. Well, that may be the case, but Isaac had a lot of problems in Canaan land. But the key ends up being he came back. He came back to the, Can the land of Canaan, and he remained there. And so, again, the simplicity of that is the whole point. These three individuals doing a couple of things and being consistent with it. Notice this. A failure is an is and in an event is not unfaithfulness, an accident along the way, continue to keep God's way, Genesis 18, 19. And I meant to put in quotes, God's way, because that's what he said about Abraham. He will keep my way. So an incident along the way is not unfaithfulness. God may say you were not faithful or you believe me not. That's not the final summary. Let me find that catch up where we were. These are points in their lives to which we are able are to be pointed to help us see the same in ourselves. We're supposed to learn from them. They have moments when anger takes over and they enter upon a hardship as a consequence of sinning, created by the occasion that anger supplies. At other times, we're allowed to see family members seduce the three ma main characters. The, the seduction, is to, uh, seduction to deviate for a particular passion of a wife or vice versa. How many times were the men those three men, um, and I'm using the word seduce in a general way. You ever think about how many times your mate or child seduces you into a set of circumstance activities first that end up with circumstances or consequences, and we give in? I'm just thinking of the countless events that I've gone through with my children where I'm hating to have them uh, be unhappy with me and at the same time I know something better is there and I allow them to seduce me like my emotions end up being played I'm tossing around whether to tell you one or not not with kids but with Lori you know, I know you've been hearing me say that we are selling our property. Basically, every place that we've been, I have actually had to make the decision, just go ahead and do it, because Lori puts down roots. And the funny thing is, everywhere we go, she put down roots there too, and she ends up being the hardest part of getting away from there. For instance, the marshals took her kicking and dragging, came back crying and bawling because that's where she wanted to be. Island time, flip-flops, no watch. Y'all know Lori's laid back. Taylor Road, back to the islands. Difficult. Coming back from the islands there, I was sick, but she was in her element. So now we're out at Cascade, and I'm wanting to be up here in Martinsville. And she says, she says, you won't be happy there. And I'm just thinking, wh which place have we been that I wanted to leave? We had circumstances that caused us to. Now, I'm calling that a seduction. I would really like to be loose so that I could accomplish more with less energy exerted. You see my point? So we're seeing those individuals. Now, what do you do when you go through that? We then see the consequences. How could we learn if we were not able to see as God narrates? It isn't God's intent that we judge the events, for God's the judge of all the world, and he has decided that Abraham is the father of the faithful, Romans 4.11. The father of all those who walk in his steps. Abraham kept the way of God. His faith in staying the course is reckoned for right wayness. Now, y'all, what if this? 
I'm going to go ahead and um, how fast or slow is the clock? It's slow? Five minutes slow? So, what if at the end of this it was the case that God judged you on like three things? Did you basically stay faithful in the sense that you never were going to leave God? And let's say, secondly, I don't know what those other two things would be because in every individual's life, there are things that you'll come into, will come into your purview or into, into your territory. But when you really strip down what Abraham was doing, a few times God put him in a position, like you might say, man, Johnny, you're making this so simple, but Abraham was called upon to offer his son. Okay, I get that. But John, do you realize what that actually was? That was God asking Abraham to go through a process that God could replicate 2,000 years later and all of the people would know that, that this was not a plan that somebody made up. And so Abraham was called upon to go through that extremely difficult process. But do you know what? The heathens all around him were doing that. They were offering their babies to their heathen gods. But God just basically needed somebody to, to set up a template or a shadowed event so that when it came time for God, as the father, to offer his son, and differently, the son was willing to go to the offering himself, and then basically Abraham now, we see why God called upon him to do that. I know that was a hard thing, but still, we're just saying, that was one of the things that God needed somebody to do, in order to build that shadow. Abraham kept the way and his faith in staying the course is reckoned for right wayness. Now this morning, as we just conclude all this, what if you've been here this morning? Simple as that. You've been here this morning. Again, your choice. I'm not leaving God and I'm not gonna let God's people not be edified. I'm going to encourage them, even if it's by me showing my face. What if that is reckoned today for this week as righteousness? Y'all, it is as simple as that. All the events that transpire through this week, they're not the summary of your life. I'm saying the coming week. They're not going to be the summary of your life unless you actually commit something that takes you off for the rest of your life and why can't we just basically say that because Abraham decided to be his fidelity to God was unquestionable and every time one of those events happened God did not impute it to his final judgment but rather he reckoned that fidel fidelity as righteousness I believe it is that simple. And I don't think this morning that we give ourselves, we, for one thing, we don't give God the glory that we really need to give him as a personality who is willing to be that generous. Who can be that generous? We're that generous with our children, aren't we? This morning, I hope you've been instructed. Second, that now you have been edified, built up, and all you need to do at this point is find something to do. I know, again, that's a general, but still, when we sing the, the song, Will Work, we're supposed to be admonishing and uh, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, teaching and admonishing one another. I cannot sing that song without thinking about something that I could figure out that I can do to encourage someone or build somebody up or whatever. And so this morning as we sing the song of encouragement, 
I hope that you'll be encouraged, and if there, as we often say, if there are obstacles that you're dealing with, and in particular, often we don't remove obstacles because we say, you know, I'm not going to be faithful. There's no way I can live up to this, and so I'm just going to leave this obstacle in place. Yes, it is the case that you can be faithful, and that obstacle may end up being an actual snare which entangles you and you never find your way out. So if you're taking notes, you can title this lesson Just and Trust. Nice and simple. And I want to start here this morning an exercise that is familiar and sometimes woeful to many of us, depending on prices. Whenever you fill up your gas tank, do you ever stop and wonder to yourself, am I really getting what I pay for? How do I know that when the pump says 20 gallons are in my tank, that 20 gallons are in my tank? Do you ever think that? Probably what you're usually focused on is how cheap is the gas. Now, I know some people that are such sticklers over gas, and I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad if you do this. It's perfectly fine. I don't blame anyone for being frugal. But I know some people that are such sticklers over gas, they have an app on their phone to let them know who's the cheapest gas in town and where can I go. And some people may drive an extra 10 miles to go to a place that gives them an extra 10 cent less. Well, I'm not that much of a stickler over it. And again, I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm just making a point here. You really kind of take it for granted that when you pump your gas, you're getting what you pay for. But how do you know that you're getting what you pay for? And I'm not trying to sow seeds of doubt. I'm actually trying to reinforce your level of trust. Y'all ever pay attention to these stickers on gas pumps? Anybody ever see these? You never seen these? Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Division of Consumer Protection, Office of Weights and Measures. Have you ever stopped to think, or do we basically take it for granted, there is actually an office, a state office, that makes sure when you pump your gas and fill up your gas tank, you are getting what you pay for. And they go from pump to pump in every state, I guess once a year, maybe more, to make sure that the pumps are calibrated correctly and everybody, regardless of race, gender, or creed, gets the same amount of gas. Are you thankful for that? Look at this. Overview of weights and measures law. Do you know this is so serious there's codified law in the state of Virginia about it? Now, I'm not trying to kick a dead horse, but I'm asking the question this morning, where does this come from? Proverbs 16, 11, a just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his work. Now, somebody may say, well, that's the Lord. Basically, it's being told by Solomon about the Lord. This is how he behaves himself. No, it's more than just that. Anyone who implements these standards, guess where it originates from? It originates from a higher source. This is a moral concern, treating everybody fairly. Now, people will say, well, the Bible is an outdated document, and we can't really base our modern lifestyle on the Bible. But this particular piece of advice is thousands of years old, and people may say, or somebody may say, well, Egypt would have figured this stuff out on their own. Well, they may have practiced this, but where did they get this type of moral authority? If you remember when they stockpiled grains for the famine, where did that come from? That didn't come from their own reasoning. That was by revelation from God, and had they had not Joseph, in, had, would they have not have had Joseph in charge, they would not have been practicing things like balanced weights and measures. This is a lofty principle. Balanced scales are just a component of something bigger. Leviticus 19.34, But the stranger that dwells with you shall be unto you as one born among you. Now, is... Illegal immigration a big deal in our politics today? Now, I'm not necessarily intending on discussing that, but I'm saying there are a host of modern social dilemmas that we deal with that aren't anything new, and this is one of them. The stranger that dwells with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now, what does this particular behavior lead to? 
If you're treating other people fairly, what does that, if they have any sort of moral core left to themselves, what does that then motivate them to do? If you behave yourself and treat your fellow man fair, chances are, or at least chances are increased, they will treat you fairly in return. Is that not the basis of the principle? It will lead to a desire for people to behave themselves better. That's the principle here. Now, here's the question. Do you recognize this? The stranger that dwells with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself. Now you may say, hmm, that sounds familiar, but I can't place it. Well, don't feel bad. The Jews couldn't either, and they read it every Sabbath, possibly. Matthew twenty two thirty six. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Now this is a scribe or a lawyer who is approaching Jesus, and I think the context here is he is in Jerusalem, and he has a succession of different sects in his day approaching him, asking him questions, looking to trip him up. And so finally you get to the scribe and he says, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now you can, if you want, put beside Matthew twenty two thirty nine, Luke, uh, sorry, Leviticus 19.34. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Look at the comparison. Thou shalt love him as thyself. Verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. And again he says in Matthew seven twelve. Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, even, uh, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. It was there the entire time. Now, whether or not they paid attention to it and inferred certain things or even read them explicitly may be a different matter. But this is not an altogether new concept. It's recognizable in both places. Now, I have a side note here. You could perversely argue that treating others better ultimately ends up being a somewhat selfish goal, you could say, in a perverse fashion. Why? I'm treating others better for what reason? So that they will treat me better. But here is the complex failsafe. In order to do that, you have to be a selfless person to begin with. Now, who could conceive of such a balance other than an almighty being who can weigh all of the complexities of human behavior and basically say, in order to, for you to get better for yourself, you have to be selfless? That wouldn't originate from within inside man. So, here's the question. How do you demonstrate that you love someone as much as you love yourself? Here's the context of Leviticus 19.34. Again, the stranger that dwells with you shall be unto you as one born among you. You treat him just like you would your own countrymen. Thou shalt love him as thyself, and not only that, but how you would treat yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God, okay? How do I treat him the way that I would treat myself? You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Okay, how do I do that? In meat yard, in weight, or in measure, just balances, just weights, a just ephah and a just hen shall you have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, let me try to make some practical application here. How is it, how hard is it, Eugene, to find good insurance? Didn't you just have that struggle recently? Man, talk about trying to squeeze blood out of a dime. Now, how old are you, Eugene, in your 70s, roughly? And you act like you're 50. And I'm saying, as good of health as you're in and the difficulty that you have finding a good insurance company and you had to go back to what you had before, how about the difficulty of finding a good mechanic? Johnny and I had discussed the fact that Lee is so trustworthy. He has no problem sending Lori to take his vehicles to get things done. The difficulty of finding a good mechanic that you can trust sending your wife to without having to worry about them trying to get over on a woman who may not understand all the mechanics what do I infer from this particular passage? I think part of what's being demonstrated here is one of the chief ways that you can demonstrate you care about people is that you treat them fairly in business. Look at this. How do people do? Proverbs 20, verse 14. It is not, it is not, saith the buyer, but when he is gone his way, then he boasteth. Isn't that how people do? When they go to buy something, if it's a particular place where they would allow you to negotiate for a better price, let's say a car dealership, or in my case, a refrigerator, 
I had Lowe's deliver a new microwave and refrigerator to us several years ago. And they delivered it. I think it was, I think that's a service on the house. I don't think they charge you anything extra for it. And the guys got there, and you've seen our refrigerator, and it's something that would have to be manhandled. It's not lightweight by any stretch. These guys unload the refrigerator, cart it into the house, put it in the slot, and plug it up. But before they do, he says, there's a little dent on the side. We can take this back and get you a new one if you want. Do you think I would put those guys through that after all the hard labor they did? There's a dent on the side that when they shove it in the back, no one would ever see. But how many people would do Proverbs 20 verse 14? I don't like that scratch. How about you take that back and get me a new one? Do you think I would do that to those guys? But how many people would try to get over on people? And what kind of a taste do you think that would leave in those guys' mouth when they have to deal with people like that on a constant basis? Do you think that makes them feel good about their fellow mankind? So, God says, The stranger that dwells with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself. Now, in one sense, is that not really self-explanatory? How hard is it to process how you would treat yourself? But the difficulty is stopping yourself when you're in an interaction and saying, how would I want myself to be treated in this circumstance? And so he says to them, here's the easiest way that you can gauge yourself, not just with codified law and how you practice it, although he gives them that standard to live up to. Here's what he says at the end of it. You were once the stranger and you would have wished to have been treated fairly when you were in captivity. And it's as simple as that. Now, here's the next question. Is this particular behavior having just balances, just weights, a just ephah and a just hen, is that just in business and livelihood? Now, do you notice the play on words? I'm using double meaning here. Is it just in business? Yes, it's just. It's right. It's fair. But is it only restricted to just business and your interactions and your livelihood? Here's the wider context of Deuteronomy 25. Thou shalt not have in thine house diverse measures, a great and small, but thou shalt have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. For all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way. When you were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou was faint and weary, and he feared not God. Now I had to ask myself when I looked at this context as I was researching just weights and measures and the implications that would have to daily life, and I had to ask myself, what does Amalek have to do with having just weights and measures in your house? And here's what I, the conclusion that I came to. Amalek was not fighting a fair fight. Rather than deal with the men of war at the front of the line, he ambushed them when they were weak and weary, having wandered, and tried to cut them off from behind. The meek, the weak, the old, and the children. He's not fighting fairly. Now, what's the significance of having a balanced scale? It yields an unbiased system that can generate a formidable amount of trust in the people who practice it. Do we trust that God ever pays attention when someone doesn't fight us fair? Have you ever been in an unfair fight? I'm not just talking about a fist fight. I'm saying in general. Have people mistreated you? Now, I know this year alone, there's been some pretty unfair fights that have happened. And I'm saying, here is an example of that. Do you trust that God pays attention to that and he will... Make up the difference when the time comes. Here's the end of Deuteronomy 25. Therefore it shall be what shall be. Remember when Amalek didn't fight you fair? I haven't forgotten that. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God has given thee rest from all thy enemies round about. In the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. 
Thou shalt not forget it. Now, somebody says, you're misapplying that a little bit, aren't you? Now, I have seen online modern commentary that say that I suppose these are humanists or skeptics or whomever. They will say that vengeance against Amalek is unjustified because it would have involved slaughtering women and children. Well, if God is just and fair, what did Amalek do? Now, somebody says, well, you shouldn't be fighting in general. Now, here's the same context. Now, y'all, I'm not trying to be funny with this, and we're all adults here, and these are just real instances, and I'll let you figure out what I mean by that as we read it. Deuteronomy 25, 11. When men strive together one with another, and we're not talking about having words, we're talking about fisticuffs. And the wife of the one draweth near for to deliver her husband out of the hand of him that smiteth him, and putteth forth her hand, and taketh him by the secrets. Then thou shalt cut off her hand, thine eye shall not pity her. Another unfair fight. And somebody says, well, you shouldn't be fighting to begin with. Well, maybe this is a justified fight. I'm not speculating one way or the other. I have no idea exactly what this context is, but there are laws in place that deal with unfair fights that apparently are justified fights. I just can't imagine necessarily that God would condone condone an unjustified fight. It could be the case, whatever's going on here, that one man is defending his family and the other man's wife decides she's going to get in the middle and fight unfairly. I'm not saying anything whatsoever about how women are treated in a secondhand nature or whatever, I'm just saying this is a particular example that we're using to demonstrate being fair and having a just balance. Now, what's the significance then of an unbalanced set of scales? Erosion of trust in a divided institution. Solomon wrote this, didn't he? Proverbs 16, 11. A just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his work. But he also wrote this, didn't he? Diverse weights and diverse measures, both of them are alike abomination to the Lord. Now, here's a point that I want to make tied to that. Now, let me preface this by saying... I know that we have discussed in the past, and Johnny has done lessons on God viewing a person's life in the aggregate. Therefore, none of us could justly condemn an individual just on a single instance of behavior, and that's not my intent this morning. But I do want to draw some application about Solomon, and you may dispute or disagree with how I'm applying this later on, and I'm perfectly fine with that, but let me give you some, uh, please give me some room this morning and let me share with you something that makes sense to me. Just because Solomon wrote Proverbs sixteen eleven, a just weight and balance are the Lord's, doesn't mean that he always followed it. He was human just like we are. What do you mean by that? First Kings 12, 1. Um, can you send Isaac to get me some more water? My throat is really dry right now. What's that? First Kings 12, 1 Kings 12.1 And Rehoboam went to Shechem for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. Now y'all remember that Rehoboam is Solomon's son. And it came to pass when Jeroboam the son of Nebat who was yet in Egypt heard of it for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt. Now Jeroboam was a servant and Solomon says he was an industrious person. Thank you Scott. Now i got more water than I can drink. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon. Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that that they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father, whose father? Rehoboam's father. Who is Rehoboam's father? Solomon. 
Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter and we will serve thee. Now, I'm saying this morning, I am speculating here, but I'm wondering what was the cause? Can we ignore the fact that these individuals are saying Solomon laid a heavy yoke on us? Now, you may come back and say, well, that's their opinion. You can't justify that necessarily. I'll give you that, but I'm saying let's consider something. These people are complaining something about Solomon. What was the cause, do you wonder? I think it's this. 1 Kings 5.13, And King Solomon raised a levy out of all Israel. Somebody had to maintain the level of opulence that Solomon had. Now granted, I get that he was made rich because of his wisdom. That doesn't mean he can't take it too far. King Solomon raised a levy out of all Israel, and the levy was 30,000 men, and he sent them to Lebanon 10,000 a month by courses a month. They were in Lebanon and two months at home, and Adoniram was over the levy. And Solomon had three score and 10,000 that bear burdens, and four score thousand hewers in the mountains. Beside the chief of Solomon's officers, which were over the work, 3,300, which ruled over, uh, over the people that wrought in the work. And the king commanded, and they brought great stones, costly stones, and huge stones to lay the foundation of the house. Now here's the word I want to key in on. The word levy is the Hebrew word mak, which means properly a burden as in a causing to faint, hard labor, a tax in the form of forced labor. Now, you may dispute whether or not this was forced. I'll leave that for another matter. I'm just saying, let's consider this this morning. Was Solomon operating with balanced scales? And if he wasn't, what was the result? And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. 1 Kings 10.4 And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built and the meat of his table... And the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I had heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not the words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told to me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceeded the fame which I heard. Happy are thy men. Happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and that hear thy wisdom. I don't doubt that he had individuals that were immensely happy with his rule. But I'm saying, is it the case that everybody was treated fairly necessarily under Solomon's rule? Or was it the case that Solomon was possibly burdening some while pampering others? And how would that make you feel if that's the case? We're out here doing labor, forced labor possibly, and all of the stewards in your house are arrayed in glorious apparel and have tons of meat at their table and they get to serve the king directly while we're out in the field or in foreign lands where the king of Hiram is where king Hiram is in Tyre and Sidon and we're excavating all of these precious stones for the opulence of the temple could that be the case and could it possibly have led to the result first kings 12:13 And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thy house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. And thus begins a very sad period of time in their history. They split and they fight. What's the application for us this morning? 2 Corinthians 10.4 uh, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Hopefully, we won't be involved in a physical fight, but surely it's the case that we are supposed to be fighting spiritually. Now, I'm going to take this in a different direction possibly than what you think. 
Here's my point, if I can make application this morning. Our fight is not just for the Lord, is it? Somebody says, yes, our fight is just for the Lord, not in that sense. I'm saying, when we fight, are we fighting only for the Lord? Or do we also fight for each other and for other people? Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said, to him, said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Why? What are the ramifications? It's not just that you will be treated better. Someday your neighbor might be your family. And if you've mistreated them, guess what? Look at this. Mark chapter 10, verse 29. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. Now, somebody says, when they read that to themselves, surely Jesus is using hyperbole. I'm saying in our day and time, do we look at that and say, he doesn't really mean that. That in this life, I would be given a hundredfold increase compared to what I've lost in this life? Should we really expect that now or in heaven? Well, he makes a distinction. He says, now in this time, I will recompense you. And in the life to come, the world to come, life everlasting, he says in this time, he will make up the difference. Do we believe that? Or is it the case, surely he's using hyperbole, or is it the case that Jesus is just as just and true as he proclaims in his word? But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. Do we believe that he actually would make up the difference? Is he that just and fair? Now, I know that we all put together in one sense that we are actively practicing this particular behavior, these ideals, but do you really meditate on it on a regular basis, like how it directly impacts your life? And do you basically count the brethren that we get to spend time with as your replacement family, literally? I'm saying the McNairs, to have someone that you really have not spent much face time with come down and they trust you and want to include you on the most possibly, besides their obedience to the gospel, possibly the most significant event in their entire life. And they want us to be a part of it. And they leave their family behind their blood family, I'm sure they would have come with them if they could have, but they leave their blood family behind to come down here and allow us to be a part of that. Do we process the significance of the level of trust that balanced scales in this place has engendered with other people? The Duncans are about to die to move here. They're actually looking at real estate now. Melissa stays in constant contact with my wife. I chatted with Matt about a week ago. And I'm saying other instances, and I don't mean to leave anybody out. I kind of put this together at the last minute because I was trying to get pictures together. This is not even the tip of the iceberg about how I feel with everybody here. So if you're not on here, don't feel like I don't count you in this. I'm saying Roger, as bad as his feet are, has loaded up an entire trailer full of wood by himself twice and driven it to our house. And this is the amount of wood that we have. I don't burn wood in a fireplace. I burn it in a fire pit. This will last me five years. And he did that on his own with bad feet. Every time I walk up my steps, I think about Mark McMinnis and the work that he did for me. And the fact that his wife is passing away, I just couldn't help but thank him yesterday again for what he did for me. And I'm saying, I think that about everybody here. Is that how we feel about each other? That's how I feel. What does justice demand? Justice, if God is really just, and I'm saying we're not making demands of God. I'm saying the principle of justice that God is beholden to of his own being and his own accord would demand of him that we regain what we lost. Leviticus 23, 22. 
And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Again, Leviticus 19.34, But the stranger that dwells with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself, for you were the strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. What's the significance that they had in their codified law about taking care of strangers? What's their history? Abraham would have been a stranger to them. Hebrews 11.8, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in impermanency in tabernacles, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. Now, what does justice demand? Abraham left everything permanent to himself behind because of his faith. But Abraham was replenished, was he not? Now, he may not have gotten to see the extent of it, but he was replenished in a spiritual sense. Now, Abraham is human just like the rest of us. What's his mind on? Genesis 12, 1. Now, uh, excuse me. Now, the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country. Now, what did Jesus say? Anybody who has given up mother, father, brother, sister, lands, get out of your country from your kindred and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. Genesis 15, 2, And Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. Now, I'm saying honestly, what is Abraham's mind on here? It's partially on the physical, isn't it? He's human just like the rest of us. Now, was that particular part of it ignored? And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born into my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thy heir, but he, he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Now, Abraham may not have understood that it would be in a spiritual sense, but surely in a physical sense, God is making him some kind of a promise here. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. God is just, is he not? And what does justice demand? That Abraham would be replenished. Again, Proverbs 16, 11, a just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his work. Now, here's the question. When I think about myself, am I being just in how I treat others? Should I treat blood better than brethren? Mark chapter 10, verse 31, But many that are first shall be last. Your blood family is not going to understand. They expect to be first, and I knew this was going to happen when the holidays came around. What would happen? All of the wounds from this year would be reopened again outside of my control, outside of my brethren, with my blood family. And I'm not talking about my family, spiritual family, that's also my blood family that's not here. What are you talking about then? What does blood family expect? Who doesn't know the gospel? Family first. And what do they say? Blood is thicker than water. You know, I was reading something recently, and it's debatable about the truthfulness of it. But supposedly somewhere along the way, the phrase, the axiom or proverb, blood is thicker than water, is actually a perversion of the statement, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. So actually when a person quotes this to you, if that's the case, they are misusing that. That would be what we say, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb, but blood family is not going to get that. When I called her and I said, we're coming up Christmas Eve like we normally do, but we're eating lunch with you. Normally our habit is all of our family gets together in the evening. We share a meal and exchange gifts. And I called her just to let her know so she wouldn't be surprised. I said, we're coming up at lunchtime, 
and we're going to leave before the rest of y'all get together. And she said, well, why don't you just stay on? And I said, I can't do that. 1 Corinthians 5 forbids me from doing that. Well, you're breaking up the family. You just need to forgive each other. Let bygones be bygones. That's just how I feel. And I said, you can feel how you want, but you know how we do. I can't go beyond what the scripture says. Now, God can replenish. Have I lost anything? I have in a sense. But look at this. Luke chapter 8 verse 19. Then came to him his mother and his brethren. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. And could not come at him for the press. And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. And I know we all know this. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. Now can I tell you this morning, from my perspective, God has already replenished me. My mother is gone. I'm not quoting Jesus here. I'm quoting me. My mother is gone. For now, hopefully. You are now my mother. And I treat you as such. And that's me saying that, not the Lord. How could I not therefore give you all preference over my blood family? Hopefully these are some thoughts worthy of consideration. I know with the holidays, different ones of us that have had the unfortunate chance at being separated from our physical family, especially during the holidays, that can be very depressing and... Maybe it makes you dwell on times in the past. Maybe it makes you wonder, have I made a mistake? But I'm saying how I feel is you all are our family. And you have replaced the family that hopefully, temporarily for now, we've lost.